before. It's always strange this bit just before you stop. <laughs> I've got this. You, have you need to ask him. He's coming. He's coming. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the best ELT conference in the world. Alberto's asked me to remind you to that we're being streamed all over the six continents, so please wave to the cameras in the back there. My name's Mick Quirk. I'm the Promotion Manager for Cambridge University Press in Iberia. Iberia, as we know, is Portugal and Spain. Some people mistakenly say Spain and Portugal, but we do know the correct order is Portugal and Spain. Okay. If you've spoken to Simon, our first speaker today, or myself in the last couple of days, you'll know that we're not from Iberia. We're from a, re a part of the northwest of England, the county of Lancashire. Anybody heard of Lancashire? Lancashire is a very, very important county, a very important region in the economic and social history of the world, really. In the year 1888, the football team from my town, Accrington, the football team from Simon's town, Burnley, plus the great Everton from Liverpool, and nine other football clubs were the founding members of the English Football League in 1888. And a hundred years before that, approximately, the Industrial Revolution began exactly in that region, in, in Lancashire. But it wasn't in Lancashire, which is the Red Rose County, where Simon and I met. It was actually across the Pennine Hills in Yorkshire, the White Rose County, in the city of Sheffield. And I'm not going to tell you the year, because maybe one of you two, two of you weren't born, so I won't tell you the year. But Simon was studying psychology, and you may ask yourselves, why are Cambridge University Press, the oldest publisher in the world, founded in 1534, I wasn't alive then, and, and Cambridge Assessment English, the most important certification uh, organisation of English uh, qualifications in the world, why are we bringing a, uh, an educational psychologist to an ELT conference. So if you've come to this session expecting creative ways to teach, to learn about teaching non-defining relative clauses, this may not be your session. I, there's nothing wrong about being passionate about, about non-defining relative clauses. I, lo I love the third condition of myself, but I suspect if you've given up your Saturday morning to come along, it's because you want to do perhaps a bit more in your classroom, yeah? Perhaps you want to teach effectively and effectively, yeah? So I'm going to leave you with Simon just to say that a, a psycho an educational psychologist, I don't know if you have a similar figure in, in the UK, they tend to go to schools and work with kids and teachers and head teachers and families when there's a problem. But what Simon's going to talk about and what the whole day today with the Cambridge experience within API, it's about teaching effectively and effectively. And that doesn't mean fixing things that are wrong, it means looking at the things that are right and going well and spreading them, okay? So thank you very much for coming. Have a great day, and I'll leave you with Simon. Morning. <laughs> now I've got this mic on, and, and this, this was my heart a second ago. Was going. This is my heart now. <laughs> It's nice to have an introduction like that. Uh, I had an introduction at a conference about a year ago where someone said, ah, I'm going to introduce you to Simon. Simon Wood, he's an educational psychologist. I've heard him speak many times, 
and he never fails to disappoint. <laughs> that wasn't a great endorsement. So I am an educational psychologist, as Mick said. I, I work with lots of schools. Uh, and traditionally, psychology was about finding out what was wrong with people and measuring it. And my profession was about that. But what I want to talk about today is positive psychology. And positive psychology is the thing that I'm passionate about. Positive psychology is the study of things going right. It's the study of what leads to people flourishing, what leads to motivation and engagement and learning and helping us be the best citizens we can be. And so that's what I want to talk about. And I had a really personal experience of why this was important. My, my daughter was uh, 20 this week. But uh, two years ago in September, she went away to university. So she left home and she went... Uh, to Leeds, which is about, about two hours away from me. And um, my daughter was really did well academically through her school. She got uh, A's at A level. Uh, she was head girl of the school. She did fantastically well. And I knew she was quite, um, quite strong and quite resilient, I thought. She demonstrated that from the age of about 12. I don't know if any of you have got teenagers here. Anyone with teenagers? Yeah, it's quite nice to be out, isn't it? It's quite nice to be away. But when she went, <laughs> yeah, any excuse. No, I've got a conference to go to. Um, when she was um, about 12 or 13, that's when I realized being a psychologist as a dad wasn't always helpful. Because when she had done something really naughty and bad, I'd go to tell her off, right, I'm going to, and she'd go, Dad, I know. I made a mistake. But the important thing is I learn from it and I don't make it again. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's very clever. And she would also say, but Dad, I'm a teenager. I'm impulsive. My brain doesn't develop fully until I'm approximately 23 years of age. And the worst one she used to do was she would say, Dad, it must be really embarrassing for you. A psychologist and you can't even manage your own daughter's behavior. <laughs> Terrible. So, me and my wife took her to Leeds, dropped her off in her new apartment. She'd all been excited in this big block. And then we set off down to the car. We're on our way to the car park and the phone went, Don't leave me. I hate it. Stay. Don't. And we said, darling, you know, you're going to have to just get used to it. We'll phone you when we get home. And then she said, I'm looking at you now. And we looked up. She was in the window with a little nose pressed against it and tears running down her face. So we set off home. It took about three hours to get home because we stopped off for a meal to celebrate. It was great. But when we got home, then the FaceTime started. She was sobbing. Oh, come and get me. I hate it here. It's horrible. And we said, you're going to have to give it longer than three hours, darling. You're going to have to. And I thought she'd be fine. Three weeks later, three weeks later, we were still getting FaceTimes at 2, 3 in the morning from her absolutely breaking her heart. I've got no friends. I hate it here. I don't like the course. Nothing's going well. Please. I've made a mistake. I've made a really big mistake. And during that three weeks, we'd been loving and kind, and we'd gone to visit her, and, and we thought, actually, we're going to have to change a little bit. We're going to have to be a little bit harsher. And we just kind of said, listen, you're not going to feel good staying in your room. You're going to have to go out. You need to do some exercise. You need to meet people. You need to join clubs. You need to... We can't see you now for about two weeks. But you're just going to have to... If it's still like this at Christmas, we'll talk about it. And about a week later, and I remember it was a Tuesday, my daughter came on FaceTime. And she was chatting. And she just seemed a little bit brighter, a little bit happier. And I said, so we'll tell what you Well, tomorrow, she said... Tomorrow, I've met some people, and together we're doing the Otley Run. And I thought, oh, she's taken my advice. She has joined a social running group. Do you have those here where everyone goes? I thought she's joined an athletics group. She's going running. I said, oh, you're going running, the Otley Run. That's fantastic. What's that? She said, you start in one bar, and then you go in... <laughs> you go in 16 bars to the other side of Leeds, and you have a drink in every one. And I thought, actually, she's going to do okay. <laughs> she's got friends and she's having a, t a good time. But the, the reason it struck me was because she'd done everything well in school. But actually, when we're talking about affective learning, had she learned how to cope really well with her emotions? Had she learned how to be independent? Had she learned resilience? Had she learned all those things? That's what 
I believe education should be, and effective learning isn't just about in the classroom, it's about preparing children for life. And when I did a talk, I don't know if anyone was there, I did a talk in Porto last year, and uh, I introduced a model, which is a, an international model around well-being. But today I just want to, uh, I'm going to look at three areas that are really important for this, for any of us as, as teachers or educators, um, in the classroom, and the things that we can do. And I'm going to look at emotional well-being, because that's affective, but I think sometimes we can talk too much about emotions, and there's two other areas that really impact that. One is psychological well-being, and one is social well-being. So that's what I'm going to do in this talk. Um, so the first area is emotional well-being. And the area I want to talk about, we, we've heard a lot, and a lot of the workshops are talking about emotions. Uh, the area I'm particularly interested in is positive emotions. We do a lot about negative emotions, don't we? A lot of people, we know a lot about negative emotions. My dad, in my house, we never talked about positive emotions. But we talked about negative emotions. My dad had some great phrases. I don't know whether you heard them in Portugal. So one of my dad's was, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> remember that one? Remember, remember that one? <laughs> that was brilliant. He did talk about uh, positive emotions. I remember him once saying to me, smile, this is a happy bloody house. <laughs> But why is it important for us as, as educators to focus on positive emotions? Because positive, positive affect, positive emotions are probably the single most important recipe for flourishing. It's positive emotions that drive us to do things, that drive us to engage in things, that, uh, that, that open up our memories, our attention, etc. Creating it as educators, creating a positive classroom environment is one of the most important things we can do. What does positive psychology tell us about that? It tells us it's hard to do because and I've mentioned this uh, before in lots of talks, but it's the most vital thing, I think, that we have to remember. You, me, the children, we all have a negative experience. We all have a tendency to focus on things going wrong. And so what we've got to do is look within our classroom, how do we overcome this? It sounds easy to generate positive emotions, but it's not, because we automatically focus on things going wrong. It affects everything. I took my children to London when they were little, and um, we were walking through Leicester Square. We got, we were going to see a show. So all the lights were there, the crowds, the people. My children, they were only young at the time, they were walking around going, oh, wow, this is wonderful. I'd lived in London for 10 years, so I knew what it was like. So while they were going, oh, this is wonderful, I was going, keep your head down, don't look at anyone, you'll get stabbed. <laughs> I was seeing threats everywhere, because that's our natural thing. So the first thing we have to do as educators is learn to notice. Learn to notice all those many, many, many things that are going really well in our classrooms. Notice the successes. How do we help our children and ourselves elicit positive emotions? How do we enhance them? How do we help them sustain them? How do we build all of those things? And, and probably one of the best ways that I know of doing it is this concept of savoring. People come across savoring? Savoring is, is fascinating. Savoring is about just learning to really focus on and pay attention and wallow in, in a good feeling. You know, if, you, if it's a really cold day, really cold day, and you're walking along in a really cold, then you walk into a nice cafe, and, and they give you a hot coffee. You know when, that, when you get that in your hand, and you just, oh, you live in that moment, don't you? You just, oh, you feel it, you smell it. That's what savoring is. How often do we do that in the classroom, around good moments, around success? Rick Hansen, a neuroscientist, says that if something negative happens to us, it gets coded into our memory almost instantly. So something bad, and then we can always remember those bad things, can't we? Positive emotions, something positive happening, he says we have to pay attention to it for between 10 and 20 seconds. Otherwise, it just becomes the background. Do you know that when you, when you get home from work, when you, you don't remember all the good things, all the things that have gone on during the day? Learning to do that is a really key thing. And all of us, in order to flourish, need a minimum of three positives per one negative basis. Three feelings, three positive thoughts per one negative in order to be even at the bottom end of well-being. Three to one. There's a top level. Uh, there's a top level which is 12 to one. Twelve positives per one negative. Some of you may know people like this. If you go beyond that, more than 12 positives per one that's not helpful. Do you know what I mean? These are the people who are just going through life going, <laughs> <laughs> I've lost both my legs, but I've still got two arms. It's great. 
not realistic. So it's not just about being positive, it is about those things. So savoring, learning to savor, is a really key skill for us all to learn, but also within our classroom. And we can do it in three, three time zones. We can do it as, uh, uh, in the past, which is just about remembering things, recollecting things. How often do you build something within your class that, that the children can look back on at their successes? Do you have rituals to celebrate success? Are there photographs? Are there books? Are there journals? Are there those things? You know, sometimes when you dig out an old, an old photograph album and you look through it and it transports you back, that's savouring in the past. Or you bring back a, a pebble from a beach that you went on. Where do we have that in the classroom? Where do young people get a chance to savour and to look back and to celebrate? My daughter does a wonderful thing on our computer at home when she comes. Without telling anyone, she changes the screensaver. And she changes it to a family picture of a great memory. And what happens is you go in and you just turn on your computer and a new photo comes up of a memory. And it just makes you feel wonderful. Do we, do we have rituals for doing that in the classroom? Do we develop them? Um, the present, being, savoring in the present, is just slowing down and taking stock and taking time and paying attention. Sometimes we pay attention to all the wrong things. We're always rushing on to the next thing and putting out fires rather than just Learning to pay attention, to take it in. My son, when he left primary school, he was, uh, so he was in year six, he was 11 years old. And uh, I was asking him about his last day. How was your last day? And he said, oh, it's good. You know, they had the shirt where you all write on it and things like that. And um, he was telling me about his lunchtime. I said, what about that? He said, well, I went into the dinner hall. So then I was sat there. He said, all my friends went out to play for their last place. But I, I stayed in there for a long time. I was on my own. I said, that's interesting. It's your last day you didn't go out and play. I said, why, why not? He said, it was meatballs. <laughs> I said, yeah, it was meatballs. He said, yes. And as I sat there, I realized this was the last time I was ever going to eat meatballs in primary school. So I wanted to make sure I enjoyed it. That's savoring. That's learning to savor. Just learning to pay attention in a moment. And learning to pay attention in the future. Learning to pay attention to, to anticipate often do we spend time doing that, just thinking about luxuriating in things that are going to come? It's something that's peculiarly human. It's what makes us human, our imagination, our ability to do that. Animals can't do that. I have a dog. My dog doesn't sit in the front window contemplating retirement and what they will do with their life. Oh, that's, that's what we do, isn't it? And our job, again, with our young people is how do we get them to Savor the future that's coming. How do we help them anticipate their learning, the, the skills that they're developing? There's a phrase in English, I don't know if you have it here, you can take a horse to water but you can't make it drink. I think that's right, I don't think that's our job. I don't think our job is to take a horse to water. Our job is to make the horse thirsty. Our job is to make it thirsty in the first place. That's about anticipation, that's about looking forward. And probably one of the biggest areas around savoring at the moment uh, would be mindfulness. People, are that, people doing that in Portugal? Looking at mindfulness, it's where we, we're so busy, aren't we, in our minds. So many things, so many rushes, so many demands, that learning to just be able to stop that. There's a lady called Ruby Wax, I don't know if you know her, a comedian, and she, she likens it to a computer. You know when a computer, when you've got too many windows open, and it crashes, and then we reboot it, don't we? We know how to reboot it. She said the human brain is like, there's got so many things going on, but we don't know how to reboot it. And our children are anxious and worried and running around and everything's going too much and they just need to learn how to be in the moment. Does anyone here practice mindfulness? <laughs> people, people are kind of embarrassed. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah it's, it's hard though, isn't it? If people find it hard. It's hard to still your mind. It's really difficult. I do. I practice it. But I find it. I, I, I'm trying to still my mind and I'm saying, come on, tranquility, damn you. <laughs> I haven't got time for this. I want it now. Is anyone else like that? I do. I go to a, a, a grief and I close my eyes. They just close your eyes. And as soon as I close my eyes, I'm thinking, am I the only one with my eyes closed? Is everybody laughing at me? I find it, I can't relax. And it, it's rather like this. I'll come back. It's rather like this. I like this. I, I really like this. Are we mindful or are we more like a dog? It's just in the moment, just enjoying and savouring. And in England, a lot of, uh, in a lot of practice, actually, the, the children and the young people are learning 
this as a practice before they start school, before lessons, before various things. Just trying to be more mindful. I put this up at a conference, and someone in the audience put their hand up, said, yes, how do you know the dog's thinking that? <laughs> so it's a cartoon. It's not, you know, it's just, so it's a show. I didn't know that, but they were very upset. Um, here's, here's some things that are happening in schools in England around this. Uh, one primary school I go in now just has to hunt the good stuff at the end of every day. The kids have to hunt the things that have gone well that day that have been really good and point them out and share them. They just, so they go on a hunt. They really, really enjoy it. Compliment cookies. This is a place that uh, I loved this. One class, what they were doing, where they were, they were baking cookies, making, you know, Chinese um, things. And then inside them, though, they had to put a message of gratitude to a teacher about how they'd really helped them. And then they cooked them, and then they handed them to that teacher. And when they opened them, there was a message of thanks and gratitude inside. That was lovely. The 365 project, that was one where there was a, 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 a class a camera, and they have, there had to be a day, a photo that represented every day of the year about success in that class. Success in any way. And anyone could take the photo at any time. So what used to happen, the teachers or students would take lots of photos, then they would choose the one that best represented that day, and children would take them away on holiday. That's great, isn't it? I work in schools with uh, children with really challenging behavior. And uh, one of the schools I work in, which is a residential school, so children who are in care and go to school on the site, and we, we set up a project like this. I was working every week with these uh, young, young men. And they, um, one of the things they had to do, we set them up, was they had to bring a photo each week, just one photo on their phone, of something they appreciated, they were grateful for. That's all they had to do. And what they did at first, they'd go out and just take a picture. Oh, that'll do. But they were quite competitive, and they wanted to have the best one. So what they, we found during the week, they would take quite a lot of pictures. Because, <laughs> oh, that's quite good as well, because they wanted to choose the best. About four weeks in, they were choosing really big things, about four weeks in, one boy came in and his picture was just uh, a cup of tea and some toast. And we said, that's interesting, how does that represent? He said, because I've realized that every single morning when I wake up, someone makes me toast and gives me a cup of tea. And that was the first time he'd paid any attention to his life was full of things are bad in my life. And that was the first time, and it was toast and a cup of tea, so that was a, a lovely thing. WOW is a school that I know, that, that stands for working on what works. And they have meetings about once every half term just to say to the kids, when, when does it really work brilliantly? When are we at our best in our class? What are the things? How can we do more of that? So the kids have to explain what they really like about the teaching and what, and what they don't. Have, um, other people doing journals, especially adolescents, just writing journals about what's they good, what have they learned, what have they noticed, what have they found, and just keeping a diary, but about success and about them at their best. Um, Board of Thanks is one in a staff room. Board of Thanks is in a staff room where people can just write up their thanks to another member of staff who's helped them or given them resources or, or spoken to them or, or things and, and just writing that up. But my favorite one is the gratitude letter. Have people come across this? A famous psych, uh, positive psychology thing. Gratitude letter, it came from the States to make you uh, feel good. Is You identify someone who you're really grateful for who's made, who's made a, a a positive difference in your life, and then you write a letter to them saying thank you. Then you get in touch with them, you arrange to meet them, and you sit in a room with them and read out the letter. And the research says that makes you feel fabulous and it makes them feel fa fabulous. Now that's the United States. They like to do that. I'm from England. I would prefer to be miserable than sit there and read. I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> there is no way in the world I could do that. I don't think, you know? So I, don't like, I, I wasn't keen on this. And then, at a conference, I was just mentioning it briefly, I kind of skirted over it, and then a teacher came to me. She said, I just want to tell you a story. She said she'd been to a, a thing that I, when I talked about gratitude, and a gratitude letter, and she decided that she wanted to write to one of her teachers. She was a head teacher now, she wanted to write to one of her teachers. So she'd gone home, she came from up uh, in Yorkshire, and, and she came home, and then she asked her mum, she said, oh, how would I get in touch with the teacher? She said, oh, I've still got her address. You can write to her. So she wrote her a letter. The letter just said, you probably won't remember me, but I just wanted to tell you what a positive difference you've made in my life, and I've gone on to become a you know, head teacher because of everything that you've done. And she got a reply straight away. Of course I remember you. Pigtails, used to sit in the back row. I remember sharing an ice cream when we went on a trip. Da -da -da. She got two other letters, well, one letter, one phone call. 
from this lady's sons, who both said, thank you so much. Mum's been really down. She's been really depressed. And your letter has really lifted her. She's talking about nothing else. It's reminded her she's just full of life again. So, so we're so grateful to you. About a month later, she got a phone call from one of the sons. And he said, I just wanted to tell you, he said, Mum's died. He said, the reason she was quite depressed is she's been ill for a number of years. Your letter made such a difference to her, would you do us the honour of, of making a reading at the funeral? We'd be really honoured if you would do that. Sometimes I don't think people know how grateful we are for the difference they make. Sometimes I don't think we're aware of that. So that gratitude, the gratitude letter is a really powerful thing. But how do we help our young people be grateful? And how do we do it for ourselves? How do we make sure we focus on the right things? Because if we don't focus on the right things, things can go badly wrong. First thing, if we really want an affective classroom in terms of our emotions, learn to overcome our negative bias. Learn to recognize we won't do that naturally. You have to have rituals in place to notice, to celebrate success, to elongate it, to sustain it. We all have to do that. You have to work at that. The second area I want to talk about is psychological well-being. Because I think, though, we spend too much time just talking about the emotions and just trying to make young people feel good. Psychological well-being is, is really uh, the things we say to ourselves in our heads. We used to think that we had a, a, a really simple thing as humans. Didn't really, we used to think there was some stimulus, something happened, and then there was a response. Yeah, that was kind of how it's most of you can think of when you go home from this conference, something you could say to, to your partner that immediately guarantees an argument. Can you think of that? When you walk in the door, what could you say that guarantees stimulus and response? For me, it's hello darling, I'm home. That's, <laughs> That's it. But actually, what we now know is that that's wrong. In between that, any stimulus is always the psychological bit. There's always the things we say. There's always the perception of that. There's always the, the talk we say about what that means to us. Do you recognize that? We have our self-talk. Unfortunately, because of that negativity bias, our self-talk tends to be negative. Tends to be negative. We have what are called... Ants. Automatic negative thoughts. Most of us will go to that. There won't be many people here who walk through the day thinking, oh, I'm great at my job and actually I'm rather attractive while I'm doing it. <laughs> Do most of us think that? Oh, I'm not doing this very well. And Oh, God, look at what I'm looking like today. Yeah, we're, we're cruel to ourselves in the things we say, aren't we? And children are. I never. I ought to. I should. I must. We don't use kind language in our self-talk. That's what psychological well-being is. How do, we, how do we learn to do it? You know, like nurses do. If you go to the doctor, the nurse is going to give you an injection or something. They'll say, you might feel a little bit of mild discomfort. <laughs> don't they? They don't say, this is going to hurt like hell. <laughs> so we need to learn to talk to ourselves in that same way. How does this look in practice? What are the things in, 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 in schools that we need to look at? We focus too much on self-esteem, just making kids feel good for the sake of it, when really we should be focusing on self-efficacy, mindsets, and optimism. How do we build these things in our classrooms? The first one is the really simple one. Mastery action leads to mastery thinking. Success leads to a change in how we see things. Overcoming a challenge, reaching a goal, succeeding in something, changes the way we speak to ourselves. Gives us some belief that actually, yeah, I might have another go. I might persevere. I might stick at that. Do all, we recognize that? I remember uh, 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 in, uh, where I live, in a place called Sefton, they have, um, they have a thing called the Wally Kane Dance Festival, where all the children from all the primary schools come and do dances in front of all the parents. It's fantastic. When I was there working with a group who were uh, really nervous, and this one particular child was so anxious, so anxious, just did not want to do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. It's going to be terrible. I don't want to do it. And backstage, wouldn't do it. 
actually managed to do it with a lot of support, did the dance, and when you've spoken to her afterwards, so what did you think? It was fantastic. Can I do it again? That, do you know what I mean? Sometimes just succeeding, just being able to do that. But that negativity bias takes over and we don't focus on mastery. Again, we focus on the difficulties, don't we? Everyone knows when they fail. Everyone can tell you all those times. Everyone knows their place in the classroom. There's a famous educationalist in England who was visiting a school in Yorkshire with a year three class, so they would be seven years old. And he sat down at a table with some children. And the children were writing about what they were doing at the weekend. So he said to them, he said to the little girl next to him, what are you writing about? She said, I'm writing about what I did at weekend. He said, oh, that's really good. Then he got a piece of paper and he started writing. And she said to him, what are you writing about? He said, well, I'm writing about what I did at the weekend as well. He said, oh. And she said, are you starting your sentences with capital letters? <laughs> I'm finishing with full stops. He said, yes, I am. She said, well, you're on the wrong table then. You should be on that table over there. Because she knew she was on the table where they didn't know how to do that. She knew what she couldn't do. She didn't know what she could do. So learn, mastery thinking is really important. Giving success, helping people, and having rituals to celebrate that. In order to do that, we have to challenge negative thinking. We have to challenge those ants. We have to help children talk to themselves in a nice way when they get something wrong. Yeah? Do you have, do you have uh, strategies for doing that? Do you explicitly do that? What's happening a lot in some English classes now, and we, we, we're trying to work with them, is, is to do that. So we have things like, um, we have gloomy Greg and hopeful Henry. So when someone's really struggling with something, we, the, a teacher will say to them, what, what, what would gloomy Greg do here? What would he be thinking? Well, gloomy Greg will be thinking, I'll never be able to do this, and I'm rubbish, and I can't do English, and I'll never get it today. And what would hopeful Henry be thinking? Hopeful Henry would be thinking, well, I can't do it yet, I'm not, but if I practice, and, and you just make it explicit. In our nursery and reception classes, they have Eeyore and Tigger thoughts. You know what? Eeyore is always miserable. Everything is going to go wrong. And Tigger is saying, everything's going to be fine. And so they talk with the children about those thoughts. They give feedback, which would be, um, when a child says, I can't do this. They say, which bit can't you do yet? It can be really hard at the beginning when we're struggling. Yeah? All, find out all the little bits you can do. We all do this. We all have to learn to dispute our thoughts. I do it in front of an audience like this. Does anyone else speak in front of audiences? So this is, this is what happens. This is what happens. You stand in front of an audience and you're doing a talk like this. And your attention automatically gets drawn to someone who looks like they're falling asleep. Okay? I don't know why I'm looking at you, madam. You've not been doing that. But. So our attention is automatically drawn. And then your mind starts going, oh no. It's going terribly. And then you think, everybody hates it. I'll never be asked to do this again. And then we catastrophize. I'll never be asked to do this again. I'll never be asked to do any work again. I'll lose my job. I won't be able to pay my mortgage. My wife will leave me. I will become an alcoholic lying in the gutter in a pile of my own vomit. Do you know, do you know what we do? And then we make it worse because I find someone who's doing that. And then I look around to find someone else who looks like they're falling asleep. It's true. It's terrible. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah? Got to learn to dispute it. So what I do now is, first thing is look for evidence. So if I see someone falling asleep, what I do now, I look for evidence of someone who looks vaguely interested. <laughs> yeah, so I look around, oh, yes, someone, someone who's going, oh, they're probably not listening to me at all. They're just, because oh, I think that's one thing we as adults have learned to do that children haven't yet. It's look like we're interested when we're not doing, you know, oh, yes, yes, no idea, no idea. So that's the first thing I do. I look for that. So it stops it being everybody hates it. It just stops that happening. And then I think of an alternative explanation for why someone's falling asleep. So in my head, I don't see that. I look at them and think, hmm, look at them falling asleep. Must be a medical problem, I think. <laughs> Possibly narcolepsy, I think. And, that's it. And, and then that helps me. Helping the children learn to dispute like that is brilliant. And we have two things. Oh, I don't know where I put it. When I said ants, so for, for uh, uh, high school, we tell them about stepping on their ants. So what they have, instead of ants, in high school they have pets. Very good. Performance enhancing thoughts. Which is quite nice, isn't it? Performance enhancing thoughts. And they like to explicitly say, when you finish, that, when you say these things, what can you say instead? 
but I like the uh, uh, juniors one better. They have pants. I think pants is much better, and that's just pleasant and nice thoughts. So they stamp on their ants, and they get out their pants. <laughs> and it's good, isn't it? Though? That's what you want. If we want to build self-efficacy, the other things that people need, mastery experience, but they also, the second one is vicarious experience. That means seeing other people succeed. Your chances of, of feeling confident and having belief in yourself to succeed is if you see someone who you think is like you succeeding. So if you're sat in the class and one of your mates reads something out in front of the class or speaks, then you sit there and think, oh, if Billy can do that, I can do that. It leads to us all. And we see people who we think are similar to us succeeding. So the mastery experiences of other people made public when we share them makes us think, well, perhaps I can do that as well. It, it, it explains lots of things, like lots of uh, very small areas of the world where certain athletes come from, or sports people, because they see a role model who they think, well, they came from my town and they did this, I could do that. It makes that possible, that vicarious experience. But the other one is social persuasion, and that means, really, feedback by people who are important to us. And in the classroom, that means teachers. The feedback and things that teachers say to young people have a huge influence on whether they develop that psychological well-being. So I've got a little task for you. I just want to, I'll just read out the top in case people can't see it. Rachel is a 14-year-old girl who is very keen on singing. And for the past year, she's attended singing classes and now feels ready to enter a singing competition. She's one of the youngest entrants at the competition. She sings very well, but she misses a few notes because she's nervous. At the end of the evening, she leaves hurt and despondent without any prizes or distinction. What I want you to do, just with the people next year talking, what should Rachel's parents or teacher say to her? You've got to choose one of the five. Can everyone see the five? Okay, you've just got to choose one of those. Thinking we're building psychological well-being, what should they say to her? Have a little talk. Which one do you think? Which one would you do? Okay, what we'll do is I'll just go through them and you just put a hand if you think that's the one that you would say, okay? So the first one, that they think she sung better than anyone else. Put your hands up if you would do that one. Nobody would say that to them. You miserable people. <laughs> and can I tell you, you would say As a psychologist, it's really interesting because I know in this room... You're saying, oh, no, I say that, da, da, da. You go out of this room, you would. <laughs> you would say to children in your care and your own, you were wonderful. You were fantastic. Oh, why would we do that? Because it makes us feel really nice saying it, and it makes them feel really nice when you've said it. It actually does nothing to build any capacity, any self-efficacy at all, because you're lying to them. It works, can work or seem to work for younger children. As they get older, it doesn't work at all. And what you're doing then is this kind of thing where children get prizes and praise just for turning up. How does that build a sense of mastery 
I just turn up, doesn't matter what I do, everyone tells me I'm absolutely wonderful. What about the judge should have made allowance for her age? Who would say that? Yeah. That's one of the things we do. We try and excuse. Oh, what do they know? They don't know what they're talking about. Do you have the singing competitions here, like um, X Factor and things? That happens all the time, doesn't it? Someone sings terribly, and then they come out, and when they've been voted off, and the, the, their family are all saying, oh, what do they know? They don't know what they're talking about. And you're looking, and between them, the judges have got 250 years of experience in the industry. They don't know. What about singing's not important? Sometimes, you know, it's, I don't know whether it's a thing here in England, you get things where, so say a child's at a drama group and don't get chosen for the lead, then the parents will say, oh, we're going somewhere else. We're not staying here. Or if they don't get to play striker in the football team, right, we're giving that up, we're finding, it's not important, let's find somewhere that does value you. Yeah, do you know that? That, that kind of happens. What about she's a talented singer and we'll win next time? Ah, yeah. uh-huh. no, wrong. No, oh, no. <laughs> Here's why. Here's why. This is really important. This is where we get it wrong about feedback. She didn't lose or not because of anything to do with talent. She did it because she was nervous and she missed some notes. Okay? If you say to a child, you're just brilliant, you're talented, you're fabulous, then why would they invest any effort or practice or anything different next time? What we're basically saying is you just need to turn up until someone recognizes your talent. The actual one we should be saying, who think that you didn't deserve to win? Who would say that? Yeah, look at these things. You, you kind of disagree, you people there, don't you? I'm not saying you would say to her, loser. <laughs> <laughs> nah, let's get you back down off your high horse. And uh, No. This is what the person who this actually thing came from, the dad said, listen, darling, if you just want to sing for fun, and enjoy it, that's fine. But if you're going to enter competitions, I've been speaking to some of the other parents. And I said, their children really practice. They practice for a few hours every day, how to calm their nerves, how to hit the notes and things. Now, I don't mind which you want to do. But if you're going to enter these and you want to do well in them, you're going to have to work harder. That's, that's the message. That's the message. I support you and I'm with you. But just saying you're a brilliant singer, you're talented, you've just got to turn up. That's, but that's what we do, isn't it, as parents? I'll tell you how I know we do this as parents. So my, my son's 18 now. When he first went to play football at the age of, we do it in England, it's six, you can join a team. I don't know what it is in Portugal, it's six. So I took my son, age six, to his first game. First thing, okay? Now, there's some children, even at the age of six, oh, they are marvelous. They can dribble with the ball, they can tackle, they can shoot, they can defend, they can attack. They're all over the place. They take a corner and somehow they get on the end of it and score. And you're like, how did they do that? Then there are other children who stand in the middle of the pitch and don't move and go, hmm, this is my son. Hmm, like this. Wouldn't kick the ball at all, unless it came near him, and then he'd go, hmm, He sometimes wouldn't even do that, because he'd be going, look at that cloud. Remember, he's 18 now. His mum came to one game when he was six. And she was watching him, stood there. <laughs> and she couldn't bear it any longer. And she said, for God's sake, do something! Anything! And I said to her, off. Go on. I'm a psychologist. I'll boost our son's self-esteem. You don't know what you're doing. So he'd come walking off. He'd come walking off the pitch. He'd say, how was that, Dad? Son, you were fantastic, mate. <laughs> you were absolutely brilliant, mate. Was I, Dad? Was I the best on the pitch? By a long way. <laughs> By a long way. Well, why didn't I get man of the match? The coach has got to be fair. He's just sharing it out. I thought now I've been nice to him and boosted him and given him his feedback. Next week he'll be fine. Next week came. <laughs> What's going wrong here? I came across this work by Carol Dweck, Stanford University Mindset, about feedback. And I thought, I've been doing it wrong. I've just been telling him he's wonderful. And he's not, he's not improving. He's not making any effort. So this was in the January I came across this. And he was nine. So he'd had three years of me telling him he was wonderful. He came off the pitch. How was it, Dad? Not very impressive, son. <laughs> Can you imagine his face? What? What, what? Was I the best on the pitch, Dad? Not by a very long way. No. <laughs> and then I said to him, I don't feel bad. 
said to him, but you know, son, I've been talking to some of the other mums and dads, and their kids, they, they practice. You don't. You don't go out and kick a ball in the garden. You don't go in the park. You, don't, you just turn up here and then sometimes for training. But you don't try and improve. You don't practice. Now, I don't mind if you just want to play fun. But now that you're getting older and it's getting more competitive, you're going to have to put more effort in. And we walked to the car. And it was a long walk for me. And it was like this. Honestly, he walked on his mouth. He was so disappointed in me. He was so disappointed. That was in about the January, in the May of that year, at the end of the season. He got the award for the most improved player. He went to his high school. He wasn't the best player then. He went to his high school, uh, joined the team, got named captain. And then he was the only person throughout the history of that school to keep the captaincy all through because all his teammates and people voted for him. Why not? Because he was the best player. Because he put effort in and he listened and he tried to improve. And now he plays at a really high level for two teams. He's gone from this little boy not doing that. And it was when I stopped praising him for talent and started praising him for effort and strategy and trying something new. So I'm not saying don't praise, but it's really important. <laughs> yeah, it's not just about that. All this does, when we build it like that, when we build mastery and we build challenge negative thinking, then what we're trying to do is promote pathway thinking, helping kids think of the future, helping them understand how to reach it and build, overcome obstacles. And we do that by nudging them, by supporting them, by coaching them, by recognizing their strengths and by being honest with them and giving them those experiences, all to build autonomy so that eventually they take responsibility for solving their own problems. We don't solve it for them and, and having an affected classroom is not making it all nice when nobody struggles. It's about helping children have their autonomy. And when you do, it's wonderful when children really have that sense of responsibility. It's, it's magnificent. Um, I want to go on to the final one, which is social well-being. Actually, let me just, I'm just going to tell you one little story about this, because I love this. It's very recent for me. There's a mum who works at a school. She's deputy head in a school, but she was telling me about her son. And her son had just gone into big school. It's still in primary school, so year one in England. So it would be five or six, six years old. She'd gone into the big school. He said, and he, he'd come home from school, and she'd say, how was school today? And he said, you know when the kids don't tell you anything? <laughs> this one day he came home, he was really excited. And he said, oh, Mum, you'll never guess what happened in school today. And she said, no. He said, well, he said, I was in the corridor. He said, and two little children came up to me. And they said to me, are you in the big school? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and they said, can you tell us where the toilet is? He said, so, I went into the classroom to speak to the miss. The miss, not miss. I went in to speak to the miss. And I said to the miss, this one here and this one here, they want to go to the toilet. <laughs> and do you know what she said? She said, well, you can take them and show them where it is. So then the miss said, but don't go in. You just wait outside. He said, but I knew that anyway. <laughs> he said, so, he said to them, so I took them to the toilet. He said, and then I, I did go in. He said, but only to show them how to lock the door and things. He said, and then when they came out, I took them back to the class. He said, but mum, do you know what one of them said? She said, no. He said, thanks, mate. <laughs> but that's autonomy and responsibility, isn't it? That sense of, ah. You know, when I talked about self-talk, your narrative, I can be trusted. I'm someone who can be helpful. I, that's how we change things, finding that. Where do we give young people responsibility? Where do we give them that voice? All of this psychological well-being is ultimately about taking, helping them take some responsibility for solving their own problems, whether they be academic or social. Which brings me on to the final one in here, which is social well-being. Social well-being... I work a lot in, in, in the arena of, of, of children with behavior difficulties and, and mental health and lots of the things that we were talking about this last night gets located in the child. Well, it's actually, when we're talking about affect and teaching effectively and children's development, it all happens in a social context. It's never separate. It's all about those things. Everything we do is impacted by the number of uh, our relationships. You know what I said before about the three to one for positives? If you want a flourishing relationship, it's five to one. You've got to have five positives for, per negative. Think about your partners. <laughs> five positives per one negative before it starts going. 
That's hard, isn't it? That's why when I'm having an argument with my wife in the middle of it, I will say, but your hair's looking beautiful today, darling. I, I, I kind of know, I know the psychology of it. <laughs> and it only takes small things, doesn't it? Small things to change that, that rapport. We know how much one wrong word, one wrong look can, can impact. My daughter, who's, um, like I say, she's 20 now, but when she's a teenager, what, this is the bonus of having teenagers, I found. When they were young, then we'd put them to bed at whatever, 8 o'clock, half 7, 8 o'clock, and then that was our time. We could, ah, we can have grown-up time. When they became teenagers, that stopped. We'd be saying, could you turn the light out when you come to bed? Because we, we're shattered. So they would come to bed later than us. But when, then we discovered that weekends in the morning was our time. Do you recognize that, people with teenagers? They don't get out of bed till lunchtime. So we found Saturday morning. <laughs> so I was in the kitchen. I was in the kitchen. Absolutely beautiful. I was cooking uh, bacon and cheese croissants. We had a bit of sweet soul music playing on the radio. I don't know, me and my wife. We're having a really nice time. Saturday morning, and then my daughter walked in. She didn't say anything, she just walked to get something out of a cupboard. And, and her and, and her mum were kind of uh, Spanish. <laughs> my wife's Spanish, that's, that's they, they practice. So then she did that, and they had a little bit of a <laughs> at each other. I had absolutely nothing to do with it, okay? <laughs> nothing to do with it. As my daughter was walking out, she was walking out the kitchen, and she looked at me. And she just went, mm. <laughs> and, you, <laughs> and you know we've got mirror neurons in our head, which means we mimic other people. If someone smiles at you, you smile back. So as she walked out, she went, mm. all I did, I just went, mm. that was it. That was all I did. I went, mm. My what? you can forget flirting, you can forget smooth soul radio. <laughs> you always take her side. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. But that's what happens with our children as well. One comment, one thing wrong. And they need to know that we, we like them. That Because it lasts a long time, doesn't it? If it goes wrong, it lasts a long time. People hold on to those kind of grudges for ages. My mum, who's 84. She's 84. And she's quite lonely. She lives quite a long way away from me. And it's quite hard to get to her. And she stopped going out much. And uh, But she t when I saw her uh, uh, recently... and. She, she was telling me a story. I said, how are you? She said, oh, she said, you never guess. She said, I was in Marks and Spencers. Do you know Marks and Spencers? She loves Marks and Spencers. She said, and, then, and she was there, and someone said, hey, is it Barbara? And she said, she turned around, she said, and there was this man there. And he said, do you remember me? And she said, no. He said, Derek, from school. And it, and it was someone she'd known when she was at school. So she's 84 now. And he said, he said, oh, how are you? He said, and then he said to her, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Clearly a bit of a player, I thought. But then he said to my mum, he said, he said, hey, Barbara, should, should we go and get a coffee? Should we go and get a coffee and catch up? Now, my mum loves nothing better in the world. She gets little coupons for coffee at Marks and Spencer's. And she's obsessed with Spencer's. She'd do anything for a coffee at Marks and Spencer's. And I said, oh, well, that was nice. She said, I said no. I said, why did you say no? She said, because when we were 17... We went out on a date, and he never asked me out on another one. <laughs> and now I've got my own back. I? <laughs> 70 years she waited. 70 years. And the saddest thing of all, she said, um, I keep going down to Marks and Spencer at the same time, hoping I might bump into him again. <laughs> Nothing more important than relationships and the things we say, and that's the same in our classroom. We're highly sensitive to things that we think are people disparaging us. or don't, We can say loads and loads of good things, but one bad thing gets rid of it all. Um, so we have to be aware of that. The biggest thing there is self-awareness in the classroom about every interaction we have as a chance to, to, to prime a kid for excellence or to just destroy them with simple, simple throwaway things. Um, we have to be careful what we focus our attention on. Especially busy times, where I spend a lot of my time working with uh, young people around, uh, with, with teachers around behavior management in the classroom. Around kids answering back or not paying attention or things that are escalating. And, and teachers are spending a lot of time getting into negative interactions with young people. They're paying attention to the bad behavior, to things going wrong. And what we've got to give is attention for the good behavior. This is, um, let me just, this is. <laughs> Thank you.
Ronaldo. <laughs> Ronaldo. But it, yeah. So what we pay attention to um, is, is really important. It goes back to what I was saying about that negativity bias. Kids are always, in England, there was a, a, a report that said there's only way, two ways that children get attention in the classroom, good work and bad behavior. Guarantees that attention. Uh, uh, the other one is listening. There's nothing more important to young people than as giving time, than as just being present, than as just listening. But we listen in a strange way. One of the things from positive psychology is a thing called capitalization. And it's about listening for good news. We're, we're good at listening for bad news. Me and my wife, before I came across this, used to have a ritual when we came back from work. It was kind of a bragging right about who'd had the worst day. Do you do that one? I'd get, my wife would tell me how bad her day was. Oh, 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 wait till you hear about mine. I'll tell you about I'll tell you what about it. We used to compete about bad days. Capitalization has changed my life. Oh. It says we've got four ways of listening to good news. And I, this has changed how I am with my children. It's changed how I am with groups. Let's take it out of the classroom. Let's say, let's say uh, someone you know, a partner or someone, uh, has got a, they've gone for an interview and got a job. Okay? Active, constructive is they come in and say, I got that job, I, I, I managed to get that job. And you drop everything you're doing, you pay absolute attention and you build, you construct. So what you do is say, that's fantastic, tell me about it. What happened, how did you feel? What did they say? And you actually help people, you know what I'm saying about paying attention? You help them take responsibility and build it into a success in their lives. Passive constructive is this. Passive constructive is, I went for that job, and I, I, that interview, and I got the job. That's marvelous, darling. What would you like for tea? Do you know that one? My son would come back from school and he'd want to tell me about his day. He'd want to come in and say, oh, Dad, let me tell you what I... And I would be saying, that's brilliant, son. And he'd be following me around the house while I was tidying up. Oh, brilliant, son, tell me a bit more. Do you know when you're not really paying any attention? Do you know, that? Well, you know sometimes when you're on the phone and you're still doing the thing? Yeah? If he came in and said, I got a detention today, Dad, sit down. Tell me the details. Yeah, we want to listen then, but we don't do it because nothing raises an alarm in our heads. Active destructive. I got the job. I went for an interview. I got that job. What? You got that job? Are you sure you're qualified enough for that? It's going to be too stressful for you. You'll never cope. Yeah, and the final one, passive destructive. When you come in and uh, I got that job. I went into you. I got that job. Shh. I'm watching Coronation Street. <laughs> Most people don't do those bottom two. Most people don't. Sometimes we do. I was always doing passive constructive. I was forever kind of pretending to pay attention but not really doing it. Do you know what I mean? Research shows if you really want good well-being, you want flourishing, it's about taking the time to do that and pay that attention. A colleague of mine was doing a parenting course for children with difficulties. And she did this with them. The next week, a dad came. And he said, I want to tell you. I want to tell you what's happened. He said, I remembered what you were saying about listening. He said, and my daughter, who was in year three, so she was seven years old, my daughter came in, and she had a medallion that she'd won for reading. So she came through the door, and she said, I've got this medallion. He said, I knew what you said. So I stopped what I was doing, got down to her level. Said, oh, that's fantastic, darling. Absolutely fantastic. What did you have to read? Oh, what did your teacher say? And then he said, have you thought about where you're going to hang it? And he said, she looked at him and she went, Dad, are you all right? <laughs> because he said he'd never spoken, it's only when she'd done something wrong. Do you recognize that? How do we build that where we just give that time, where we, where we do that? My wife used to work with adults with learning difficulties and I would, we'd go on holiday with them. And it used to infuriate me, there was one guy called Andrew, and you'd go into a, a pub or a restaurant, he'd have a table booked, but on the way in, he'd talk to everybody. He'd be walking in going, hello, I'm Andrew, I'm chatting, and we'd all be saying, oh, come on, we've got food to eat, and we're scheduled, and he'd be talking, and then everybody before they left, they would come up to Andrew and say, see you later, Andrew, and I realise now, he was right, I was wrong. He was just giving time to people and relationships and things, rather than rushing through, because he was scheduled. I learnt a lot <laughs> And then the final two, the final two things just on here, just very quickly, are um, where it really goes wrong and gets hard to keep that rapport is in 
is that behavior management scenario. When children challenge us a little bit in the classroom, you know that, and we end up saying things or doing things that, that stop that rapport straight away. Yeah? And actually what we've got to develop are skills around how we react to things. So we've got to have things like redirection technique. We've got to build on those. So redirection techniques are just those techniques that, that stop us getting into any conflict. We'll do, we'll do one. We'll do a very simple redirection technique now. Do you know, do you know the look? You know the look? The look you give someone? The look your dad used to give you to say, don't make me come over there? Do you know that one? Does everyone know the look? It stops you having to speak to children. You just give them the look. Is everyone comfortable with that? Okay, so what we'll do, we'll practice. You can show me. I'm going to count to three, and then I want your the look. Okay? Are you ready? Everyone ready? We're going to take charge of our own emotions now. One, two, right, sorry, I'm just going to stop you. Doing the look with a big smile on your face is not going to work. All right, you've got to, you've got to, jeez, give it the look. Are you ready? We haven't started yet, madam. <laughs> after three, after three. That's a scary one. I would do anything you said. One, two, three. <laughs> there's all the different ones. This, this, there. Looking over there. There's that one. And the best one is a lady just here doing it, which is that I'm so disappointed. In you. Do you know that? I can also see where I went very wrong. Uh, as a teenager there, because I would have taken some of those as like seductive looks. <laughs> it, was, it was obviously people going, stay away. I know, oh, oh. but that's a different matter altogether. Um, and then the final one is, is, is about positive language. We automatically, because of that automatic negative thoughts, we go to, we go to the wrong um, language. We end up saying things to children. We end up labeling them sometimes. I met a five-year-old boy who had, uh, was, was problems in the classroom. I said, hello, I'm Simon. He said, hello, I'm Naughty Elliot. <laughs> Not I'm Elliot who's sometimes naughty, I'm Naughty Elliot. That, that's what he talked about. We use labels, don't we, like that? My dad used to say to me, are you lazy or just plain stupid? <laughs> and I remember thinking, it's not a great choice. It's not, it's not fantastic. Um, so, that's really important. In fact, uh, just after this one, uh, I'm going to do a workshop which is all about the language that we use in the classroom around behavior and redirection techniques and lots of practical things for how we can script ourselves to respond in, in a better way around that. Um, which I'm just, I'm just aware of the time, so I'm just going to move on just quickly. Um, I don't know if people know this man. This man is a guy called Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell, famous violinist. Uh, he was playing in, in uh, Washington. And they did a, a really good social experiment. He was playing in Washington at, 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 at the hall, uh, charging whatever it was, $100 a ticket, sold out massively for everyone. But then they did a little experiment. So people were fighting to get tickets to go see him, world-famous violinist. They did an experiment. They put him down in the subway for a day. Nobody didn't tell anyone who he was, so they just played. He was playing in the subway. His violin's worth $3.5 million. He played all day. He made $32. The reason to tell you this is, people can only shine if we create the environments that allow them talents to come out, if we, if we recognize it, if we nurture it, if we, have, if we celebrate it. Our job as teachers is to, is to create that environment. We can only create that environment, I feel, though, if we look after our own well-being. So we have to be aware of that. Some of the things we need to think about are taking care of our body. Practice that gratitude that I talked about. Nurture relationships, which means <laughs> talk to your partner for one hour, three times a week. Now, you've responded to that very well. In England, everyone goes, that's ridiculous. <laughs> one hour, three times. And then people will say, can we split it up into 15-minute segments? <laughs> Do more activities that engage us. Develop those strategies. Cultivate optimism. Avoid overthinking. You can read those, but we have to look after our own well-being. And the bottom one, though, is practice acts of kindness and contribution to others in the world. Because I firmly believe that our job as educators, to be the kind of educator, to be the kind of teacher, so that at some time in the future, a letter falls through your door, thanking you for helping a young person become the successful person that they are. That's what we should all aspire to. That's what positive psychology is about. 
Thank you very much for your time this morning. Oh, sorry. Sorry. One more thing. Some of you may be a little bit worried about my daughter. <laughs> this is my daughter. That's me. That's my daughter. So she's taken to university life. Thank you very much.